Okay, let's bring in our panel right now. C. Scott Vanderhoff, the recently retired five-term Republican Rockland County Executive. Tough to get elected five times to anything. Uh, Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. Brad Gerstman, political consultant and founding partner of Gotham Government Relations. And Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. Um, I'll start with you, um, Scott, in that has there ever been an internal investigation launched by any level of government head that didn't come back with findings that they wanted them to come back with? It is very hard to think of any. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it that way. I mean, the fact of the matter is that there are three major players here were not interviewed, okay? All the other emails, all the material there, I think is interesting. I went back and took mm -hmm. a look at the report, and it does give some credibility to some of the, some of the information that we've heard before. But the fact that the closest people to the governor have not spoken, uh, and that it's his lawyer, essentially, who's yep. given the report, uh, l lends a real question mark to it. And, and obviously, so everybody's going to wait for the next report. The next report will be done by the legislature, and I don't expect that'll be very fair either. So. No, no. It seems like everybody's got a dog in the fight. The feds may have the, the best report if it comes up. But Dominic, the lawyer in question, Randy Master, you know. Uh, and, and for you, about 25 yeah, years. Yeah, for about 25 years. I just had an optics question, which was, listen, we know how the public goes in this. They're not going to read the whole report, the vast majority of them. They're going to look at the headline of it, okay? Right. I understand the master did a good job today, but there was a chance that they could have played this report off, since there were federal prosecutors who were part of this 12-man investigative team, that it would have looked less of a, you know, salutation for the governor. They went out of their way to tell you how great the governor was for an hour and a half. They could have, I think, just from an optics standpoint, you know, said, hey, these are some of the problems we found in the investigation, but at the end of the day, nothing gets directly back to the governor. Instead, it was almost like a campaign speech for Chris Christie. Hey, did you get the same vibe? Of course, and that's what happens when you're paying a million dollar fee to counsel to do the investigation. In the 25 years I've known Randy Mastro, in particular when he served as Rudy, one of Rudy Giuliani's top deputy mayors, I can't recall one time, not one single time, that Mr. Mastro disagreed with Mr. Giuliani or went the other way. And so we're supposed to believe now that you're doing an independent investigation where you're being paid a million dollars. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. Yeah, but I, I see it another way. I see it where... Uh, the attorney for Christie, he has his name on the line. He's the one coming out with the report. He's saying that there's no wrongdoing on behalf of the governor. Okay, so his name is on this. He knows more reports are coming. But, so but, when but they do they, come, he can't just be... But five Brad, other though, reports. But Brad, isn't... You're 100% right, and I thought about it too. If you look at the 12 people, they may not be, you know, common names to the general public, but you've got former federal prosecutors on this list and whose reputations are going to be attached to this. But if you don't interview the select group, uh, just as the county executive said, if you don't talk to the three most important people um, that are involved in this investigation, you do have the veil of, hey, from the people we spoke to, these are the answers we got. By definition, it's an incomplete report. Doesn't everybody have cover? Well, there's, there's always, look, there's always going to be areas that you can shoot into in a report and say, wait, this doesn't make any sense. But based on the people they interviewed and based on what they said, uh, from an evidence standpoint, they found that the governor had no yep. involvement in this. Okay, so uh, there are important names. These lawyers, they have reputations. I'm a lawyer, so I do give some deference to the lawyers who do it because they know that there are more reports coming anyway. Do they want to be, you know, yep. smeared so bad that, you know, that they're, you know, that they can't sure. be recognized tomorrow? I mean, yeah. that's, they know that they need to do the right I thing. I agree with that, but I think the point is the way it was presented was almost like a, a, a pep rally. And, well, there's two parts. So one is the evidence, two is the PR. Yeah, yeah. and the pep rally part of it about. gives the wrong side of it. This is a straight factual, lay it out on the table, uh, but it looked more like... I thought it was an opportunity missed by the governor. Uh, let me say it that way. If you're in the governor's camp, I don't think today accomplished what you wanted. But, Andrew, I took away, there was a couple of factual things that came out of this report. Namely, what you heard um, Ms., um, the, the, the legislator in Jersey talking about, Loretta Weinberg, 
the conversation of Wildstein and the governor. We hadn't heard that one before. That came out to say, hey, he told the governor about this in December. That was long before he all of a sudden went in front of the cameras after the, the record went public with the story. We had heard unspecific claims from Wildstein that the governor knew about it, but we didn't know when that happened and we didn't know what the communication was. And we still but it went on to say that even the if they did have the conversation, it wouldn't matter. And that's significant, Turn, I think. Turns out Wildstein told him on September 11th, while Wildstein in his capacity with the Port Authority was meeting with the governor at the World Trade Center site uh, and told him about what was happening at the, at the George Washington Bridge. We do not know if he said, we've done this, or if this was political payback. We don't know the specifics of what he said. But this puts the governor in a difficult position because, as you pointed out, A, the governor heard about it and doesn't remember, conveniently, uh, as some might say, and, and two, uh, he didn't do anything about it. And so when well, he his argument would be he believed there was a legitimate traffic study here, so why should it raise the level of action? Well, but you would still wonder if the yeah. governor of New Jersey might have an interest in a massive backup that was going on at the world's busiest well, bridge, and particularly the access to New York City. Well, put it in perspective, though, Andrew. I mean, he, here he's in the middle of a memorial for September 11th. He's a public speaker along with other, other public speakers. He's got a job to do. His mind is not on a traffic jam in Fort Lee, a assuming he doesn't know why the traffic jam which is a fair point but he also went before the people of new jersey in december and in his joking i was the one who put the traffic cones out manner basically dismissed any notion that there was any sort of problem or foul play at the george washington bridge Just, and yeah. then in the two-hour press conference yeah. the come to jesus press conference that he uh, had There's he no again said i didn't yeah. know about this until a couple of days ago actually yes you did you knew about it in september the the question now is did he know about it before it happened hey brad put the lawyer hat on for a second um, uh, Bridget Kelly um, wasn't just run over the truck in, in that two-hour presser that Andrew mentioned from a few months ago, but she's been repeatedly backed over today, yet another example. At what point does this disincentivize her to be quiet at a certain point and take whatever immunity deal? Is there, is there a point where you're, if you're Wildstein, um, if you're Bridget Kelly, um, if you're Sepian, that you say, I'm sick of being the punching bag here, you know, I, enough of this. Yeah. Only one of them's found work. Yeah, th this, is, this is a very difficult situation, and uh, this comes up, you know, in all these public situa is, uh, events that occur where there's criminal investigations and there are people that who can participate and cooperate. Um, they get a beating in public. Look, th there is a line that can be crossed, and each individual has that line. So, um, you know, to keep, keep being run over one day yeah. after another after another really is something that will could turn could turn you one bet, person against you. Think against one of them is going to take an immunity deal because yeah. right now they still haven't said what's the crime, right? I, I mean, it's a, a misuse of power, abuse of power, whatever you want to call it. A but deal. where's the crime? Someone will take a deal. Yeah, always count on it. And notice the goalposts keep moving for Governor Christie at this point. At first, it was I don't know anything. Then it was I didn't know about it until just now. Then it was I didn't know about it at the time. Now it's, I don't know about it, I didn't know about it beforehand. But guys, if nobody talks and then puts the governor, um, you know, between September and between mm. that press conference, then it's just hearsay. The other thing that came out today was they went out of their way to say, Mayor Zimmer in Hoboken, she's a liar. Now, that was an anecdotal conversation. Now, they can say there's been no evidentiary uh, proof here that Hoboken was harmed in any way or shortchanged, but... Uh, that I also thought was a little bit of a leap. They were very strong to say there's no truth whatsoever to what she said. It was, apparently was a private conversation with her and the lieutenant governor, so I, I didn't get that one either. No, it was a little strange that it was so strong. Uh, and, of course, she came back and said, well, it's just she made Dominic's point. You know, you paid a million dollars, you got what you want uh, kind of thing. But, you know, I, don't, I think the one thing that's true about this is each time another piece of information comes out, that says he may have known or was told or so, it diminishes him. It diminishes his whole character uh, it, with respect to any presidential run. And he clearly has said here in the last week when given opportunities that not only has he not ruled out a presidential run here, but he doesn't think this will impact him. I know you're laughing, Don, but, uh, but the point I am is, laughing. Right, but the point is. wishful thinking within mm -hmm. his own mind. No, All it's right. beyond his own mind. If you don't, it's, and, and, and I understand where you're coming from, but the political reality is the Republican big donor money is still behind Christie. They're a little bit cautious right this minute, but they are pushing him. The Northeast money, where most billionaires live, okay? The they, Langones in the world. Of and the it's world way beyond him. They're going right. to get him and run him short of any, like, major criminal, uh, you know, 
conviction here uh, based on his behavior. Would Hillary Clinton Britain. just love that if mm. Christie was a nominee? We're definitely getting ahead of ourselves now. All right. Uh, now, everybody at home, be sure to head over to Facebook and Twitter. Sound off on today's question. Again, how much weight do you give today's Bridgegate report? And no, we weren't trying to be cute with a question. Okay, coming up next. President Obama, he meets with Pope Francis for the first time. The president says they focused on their agreements and not where they divide, like on social issues. What does the president need to gain here from his visit to help his image and also his belief that economic inequality could be a winning electoral message? We'll be right back with that.